introduction. I don't know, can you hear me without the microphone or do you need it? Can you hear me without it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a nice hands for you can roam around. Yeah, so um, I'm a consultant here in Hasselbar, County Mayo, and I want to talk to you about women's health and the emphasis being on health. And this lovely picture that my daughter draws, uh, picture, um, so it visited very nicely. Health means that you can do what you want, you can see the world how you want to see it, you can roam free around, unhindered. And that's basically what we want, because at the moment, what are we doing? We're doing actually sick care. We're looking after the sick people, but we're not making them healthy. We're not looking after the health we Now, where's the sticky here? It is. Right, so why am I here? Well, as you have from the accent at this stage, <laughs> and uh, um, we Germans, when well, you have met the Autobahn as a tourist, I guess, um, we are sort of very precise and sort of very sort of formal and all these sort of things, and it's very nice for research and all that. And something was missing. The heart was missing, the warmth was missing. And I met a few, so um, a friend of mine had emigrated to Ireland, and my dad said, Gosh, Ireland is a immigration country, you don't immigrate into it. Anyway, so this friend is in Ireland. And I said, Gosh, and friendly, up to you, it's, how are you, love? And I said, of course, maybe I should come over and check it out. <laughs> so I did. And, um, but then I'm here, and um, all these things happening, and healthcare as I believe, but it's not quite right either, it is it's healthcare. But although this has this friendliness there in the Irish country, whatever, we are still doing the Western healthcare thing. And then I came across um, well, some new ideas about diet. My daughter actually became vegan at the gosh, that's all this about. And I looked into it and I said, gosh, there's a lot of science behind it. But then I tried to untangle the science a bit like this uh, picture here. All these different studies, which one is the right study to look at? This nutrition science, right? There's all these different studies out there. And um, we have to sort of really ask us what is the right study to do. And there's basic sciences. And they are lab work, and they are designed to reveal how something works. And we need those. We need to find out how works exactly, what these molecules doing. And then we need to do randomized controlled trials to see the attribution. So A causes B. But then we need to see also what's happening to the whole population. What happens to the Adventists, or what's happening to the nurses health study. These are big, sort of large population studies. And often what we've seen in these wild storms of discussion in the media, even the um, JAMA, and all these are sort of controversial, is that the wrong study is, um, the wrong scientific approach is attached to the um, right question. So science is a tool to answer questions, not a substitute for sense. Sense is the source um, of the right question. That's not by me, that's by David Katz, actually. No, obstetrics and gynecology is a fantastic specialty. Absolutely fantastic. But we literally look after our patients from the cradle to the grave. And there's all this fantastic journey along which we accompany our patients with. And this is absolutely amazing. I'm extremely privileged every day to sort of accompany my patients through this amazing journey. And it's all here. But the trouble is, despite all that, our patients are not prepared for these amazing journey they are setting a new human being on. So I want to uh, talk about two issues in pregnancy where US GPs have an amazing opportunity to actually set this new human being up to better health. Well, as I say, most couples are not prepared. 50% of pregnancies are uh, unplanned anyway, and the remainder of the pregnancy is 50% of Irish women in the first uh, age are overweight and are nutritionally deficient. This is an Australian study. So we can see here, this is point of view, this So there we have overweight or obese, 50%. That's what should happen. Obesity should come down before you plant like this, but it's not, is it? Um, then eating five fruits a day, where 9% do that, should come up to 100% before pregnancy. That's not happening, is it? And then uh, drinking alcohol, well, here we are, the blue line, 60%, right? That's not going to go down either, if pregnant or not. Taking folic acid, <laughs> well, maybe it's going up a bit, but not really. Smoking, not really changing either. 
So nothing changed, is it? So people are not getting ready. And here we see this Australian study there, how many people are there in the hundreds of nothing, you know, and um, they're on here. Right. So let's talk about pregnancy and let's talk about two uh, pressing issues um, in pregnancy. And one is sort of the brain. Now I'm obviously not going to worry this. But the truth is, you see, when you're pregnant, your little unborn baby depends entirely on your nutrition, how it's going to be. And that's when we have the unique opportunity to advise our patients to actually do whatever they can. And the good thing is, being an obstetrician or being a GP looking after a pregnant patient, these patients are very highly motivated because they're pregnant. Now they suddenly have a huge responsibility on them for another life which they're carrying inside them, and this may be a good opportunity to do it. So what's happening? And most of our diets nowadays um, have a um, very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. So these are polyunsaturated fatty acids. There's omega-6, there's omega-3. They are sort of the building blocks of the alkylides, and we come back to that in a minute. And um, humans have evolved on a one-to-one -one diet, we, what we should have, omega-6, omega-3, but we are mostly ending up with a 10-to-1, even 40-to-1 uh, omega-6, omega-3. Right? And that can lead to problems. And these echinozoids, which are then produced by the omega-6, they are related to arthritis, inflammation, and cancer. And guess what? So what these pathways we actually block with COX-2? On each time. So Valencia Schinquina from Vienna, which is a fantastic study, she could show and published in Molecular Psychiatry <coughs> last year that high exposure to omega-6, PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acids, causes cortical neurons to lose their positional identity and axonal selectivity when mouse feet are exposed to excess omega-6 pufa right, in utero. In conversion of omega-6 pufa, as I said, into iconazonoids that disrupts the temporal precision of signaling at neuronal CP1 cannabinoid receptors, and GP deregulating step 3 dependent transcription cascade, that's what I said, the gap studies we need, right, to say, well, how is this working at all? And what does mean, at the end of the day, is these are the changes which we find in the ABH journey. Right? These are the changes. Right? And you all are aware as GPs, all these kids coming in with ADH, that's where it might come from. From the wrong ratio of omega-6 to omega-3. Now, Monica Lopez Vicente from Barcelona took up the button and looked at, okay, let's take court samples. Right, of these babies, let's see the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio and see what happens. And guess what, 2,644 babies in Spain caught samples, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, and the higher it was, the more the ADHD index went up. And further on, uh, we had a fantastic study here um, from the AVEN uh, cohort study, longitudinal study of parents and children, 14,500 uh, people in that. They postulate us through the epigenetic process of DNA methylation of IGF-2, higher IGF emissionally predicted ADH symptoms. And the prenatal unhealthy diet was associated with higher ADHD symptoms indirectly via IGF-2 methylation. So another process there which happens with the in, uh, unhealthy diet, another opportunity, another reason why we should take the opportunity up to actually do that. And you see here the prenatal unhealthy uh, diet was positively associated with that methylation early onset conduct problems and low um, conduct problems in the news. So interesting studies there. This whole process then, however, moves on. So you already have the intro drawing sort of process which may sort of set up the brain for difficulty, for coping less well with life afterwards. But then, of course, there's the children's here. Of course, I'm not a pediatrician, and I don't want to sort of hold into that tomorrow. But we will meet, or I will meet, or you will see these patients again later on when they're adults. So we have to look at adversity, which adds an on to the brain with further problems. And Bridget Callahan from Columbia had shown that adversity is a potent risk factor for both gastrointestinal and mental illnesses. And we've all heard about this blood brain. And they had done a fantastic study where they actually looked at children which were subjected to adversity. So institutional care, which is one of the most highest level of adversity you can think of, and compared to risk control. 
And they could not only show that their gut microbiome changed significantly, but they could also then show in MRI pictures that actually their uh, frontal cortex changes and the reactivity then when they were shown scary images and the activity to those changes. Now, why is it relevant to women's health? Well, because uh, many women, as we see, have lower abdominal pain, chronic pain, which then can be understood both by the women and the caregivers as sort of gynecological issues. That's why it's relevant to women's health, and that's why it's important to be aware that these things are set up in the uterus, these things are set up in the childhood, and then we see these women as teenagers again with their chronic pain. Here you can see the slide there with the adversity, and it calls gastrointestinal upset. Now, that was the one thing I want to talk about pregnancy, so setting up the brain for a pathway later on in life. The next thing we want to talk about is the uh, vessel damage, the vascular damage, and uh, how it is related to uh, pregnancy complications <coughs> and then later on in life. Because here again is an opportunity. The pregnancy is, is the first time a woman's body is really challenged from all aspects, the woman's mind of course, right? So it's a huge challenge for the body. And whatever health problem later on will develop may be unmasked in this first place. So this vascular damage uh, caused by lipid peroxidation and trimethylamine oxide, the word which I had to say, say 50 times to get it right, <laughs> when we come to that in a moment. So anyway, this vascular damage in pregnancy will cause preeclampsia, pregnancy loss, abruption, miscarriage, stillbirth, premature living, all devastating events, all devastating events, all due to the same fact, the vascular damage. And later on, this vascular damage will set up this woman for hypertension, mild heart infection, Alzheimer's disease, as we've so eloquently heard from my previous speeches. Now, this is very complicated, uh, but again, if we need to laugh, study to get it uh, right there. Basically, this shows the free radical mechanism of lipid peroxidation, and this symbolizes um, LRs and the, uh, these um, ancillary fatty acids and so on. I probably won't go too much into that. Uh, move on to the next one. Maria Adler from the Netherlands could show in a generation R birth cohort study that triglycerides and remnant cholesterol in early pregnancy are positively associated with preeclampsia. This is the same thing as Nail knows about the cardiovascular damage, same thing set up the woman for preeclampsia. Total cholesterol, low density lipoprotein, low density lipoprotein, especially triglyceride, remnant cholesterol are positively associated with high blood pressure in pregnancy and six to nine years after pregnancy. Triglycerides and then vernal cholesterol um, are these problems. Now, this shows how the diet comes into that. Carnitine and choline from animal products, animal based foods, they stimulate the gut flora to produce uh, trimethylene amyl lines. And then in the liver, that's made to trimethylene uh, amyl lines, uh, oxidized. And that then leads directly to arteriosclerosis. Here we can see that again. Red meat, poultry, liver, here, carnitine, choline, right? The microbiome makes TMA out of that. And then the liver then makes TMIO out of that. And that then leads to arteriosclerosis. Same process happens later on in life, happens also before pregnancy or in pregnancy. Here we see it again, just as the message comes home. <laughs> Same thing. And here we see a comparison of the damages, right? So the first four uh, images are in pregnant women with severe preeclampsia. You see the same lipid laden macrophages here in a severe preeclampsia patient, right? In the uterus, as you see here in a patient with heart. Same damage. Same damage. Same cause, same cause animal problem in the dark. And here this is very eloquently this sort of poster, it was on the front of the uh, JAMA there, with the fast sort of studies there, very nice to see all these complications there, gestation hypertension, preeclampsia, small progestational age, gestation diabetes, preterm delivery, all these things are connected. And as I said, this is a unique opportunity we as obstetricians and USGPs have 
to set the patient up to the right path. Protect her children, protect her, not only for now, not but also for later life. Both, both patients, the unborn child and so on. Here you see this uh, fantastic study there, but it's also, if I can see, um, how they're associated. And you can see here, the incidence here, hypertensive disease of pregnancy, how much more likely they are for a diagnosis with coronary artery disease, how much more likely they are for heart failure, how much more likely they are for arteriosclerosis, uh, and here for uh, microbial irritation. All these diseases go up if you have uh, high blood pressure in pregnancy. But the good news is there is hope. One can reverse these things. That is good. This is from um, Dr. Esselstyn's book, right? Called Will Esselstyn's book here, uh, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. And here you have a positive emission tomography performed by a patient with coronary artery disease. There you can see there's so <coughs> gaps there, there's no perfusion. And then here, three weeks later, after a plant-based nutrition intervention, that perfusion is back. Right? Isn't that fantastic? And many of you have probably seen this picture already. And here you need to see a coronary angiogram, reveals um, a distal a disease, the distal left anterior descending artery. Right? And here, 32 months later, after plant-based nutrition intervention, that's all nicely flowing again. Isn't that fantastic? So the next time you see a 42-year-old woman coming for her first pregnancy, make sure you use that opportunity to give a nutritional intervention. Because her blood vessels may already be pre-damaged. She's going into pregnancy uh, with uh, having experienced already Western diet for those 42 years, but you may be able to reverse this if you set it up for the right path. My patients are always horrified when I tell them about diet, but many of them have a farming background, they're living in the west of Mayo. But that is an important message. That you can help your baby and help yourself to make the best out of this very precious pregnancy. Is that all clear with the pregnancy issue? So these are the two things I want to say about pregnancy. And moving on, moving on swiftly, uh, to um, women's health um, outside pregnancy. And one big issue is endometriosis. And you all know about it, and most patients come to me, say, oh, my GP said I probably have endometriosis. Right. And the patient believes she has endometriosis. So they're all scared about it. And they're scared about this, what do you think? Why they're scared about this? Why are they also scared about endometriosis? That's right, you're very right. The fear is that they won't be able to conceive. That they're very right. And we come to that in a moment, sir. Why is this? Why is this fear such an important thing? So, what's about it with endometriosis? Endometriosis is a disease where the blood has spilled through the tubes into the pelvis. Now, the truth is, this probably happens to every woman, every time. Right? And the question why is it in some women a problem and in others it isn't? So, why do the um, blood endometrial cells get removed in some cases and in others they don't? So probably there's an immune response uh, which is uh, at fault, and there may also be hormone levels which may be caused. Now we do know that red meat intake decreases the sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. And what does this globulin molecule do? It carries estrogen, right, and other hormones. And if it doesn't carry enough, well obviously then there's too much free. And what does free estrogen do? It stimulates the endometrium which you just have spilled into the pelvis from the retrograde menstruation. So these plugs will then keep growing if your SHB levels are too low. Right? So, and then um, estrogen upregulates prostaglandin synthesis, and evidence of positive feedback for uh, low to estrogen and prostaglandin may favor the inflammatory and polyphenol characteristics of any issue. The gut uh, microbacteria we've already discussed, um, they can be, they are different depending on the diet, and they also modulate the immune response. Lipopolysaccharides is a bacterial endotoxin, which is made by bacteria which are sort of thriving on a Western saturated fatty acid diet, and they are markers of inflammation, and um, they uh, bind to the toll like receptors. And um, these then uh, make the gut lining so permeable, and these inflammatory products, products come through, and this may all lead to the inflammation, inflammatory process, which then promotes the endometriosis from keeping up. Now, 
after these experimental data, let's move on to studies again. This is a, a Northern Italy study between 1984 and 1999. 504 women um, were combined with uh, controls. They had laparoscopy, confirmed diagnosed endometriosis. And you can see here they stratified them after diet, right? So if they, oops, sorry, for you. If they were on beef and red meat, right, they had a more than two times more likelihood of getting endometriosis. And if they had a very high green veg intake, it was half the risk. Isn't that fantastic? Fruit, less than half the risk. And here, ham, increased risk. Nice and simple. Now, a bigger population study, nurses, health study two, 82,000 uh, nurses were followed up, and again, we observed the red meat, both processed and non-processed, were <coughs> associated with increased risk of laparoscopically confirmed endometriosis. And this association was strongest amongst women who had never reported such an issue. And heme iron um, was also associated with this strong, strong endometriosis. Because heme iron is an oxidator, not an antioxidant, it's an oxidant. It's an oxidant right? So heme iron, which is in red meat or meat, is an oxidant. Right? So that causes obviously a well. Yeah, a case report out of my own sort of cohort. Um, this lady, 34 um, year old, let's just call it here, obviously, that's the real name. Um, she came to me with chronic pelvic pain, pain with intercourse, chronic constipation. And examination was sort of what we call a frozen pelvis. Nothing was moving, or was fixed in the pelvis. The uh, uh, transvaginal scan and the MRI confirmed a five centimeter complex mass. The CA125 was raised, which is a cancer marker, which goes a bit up in endometriosis as well. So it looked quite um, devastating diagnosis for a young woman who had recently married and hoping to have family. And now this is happening. Pelvis is clogged up, this endometriosis, all is rocks on the top. I said, okay, uh, I said, well, we have all these sort of different options, we can do this surgery, we can do all these sort of things, or we could try to get your inflammation down, we could try to sort of uh, stimulate your, um, uh, regulate your estrogen balance, and all of this uh, with changing to a whole food plant based diet. But obviously, I gave her, as you correctly pointed out, gave her proper medication as well, the um, desogestrol, progesterone. And the good news was the patient was very motivated, and um, often the nice thing is when they come with their husbands, the husbands are even more motivated. <laughs> because they obviously care for their women, which is very nice. And um, so together they said, okay, we, we try this, and we give this a go. And what I always do is I give the patients sort of, um, a few books. So I have this nice cardiologist, Daniel Bellard, who's written sort of a um, patient book for patients, I give them that. And I give them here from the Irish Vegan Society, this book is here, The Vegan Guide. And if they're very interested, I give, her James, give them James Donovan's book about transition to vegan agriculture, but that's only very few. So anyway, this couple was very motivated, and off they went. And I saw them seven months later. The pain was gone. She had normal bowel motion. And she, uh, her bleeding was normal. And her CA went to five, because we turned normal. And I did a transvaginal scan. And I couldn't believe my eyes. Perfect. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Nothing to be seen from the disease anymore at all. Absolutely fascinating. So obviously patient and myself were both overwhelmed. This way. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> off she went. <laughs> Moving on to infertility. Yes, you're very right. Um, infertility or the fear of infertility is very, very big. And it is true that unwanted childlessness, unwanted childlessness, is the biggest grief a person can experience ever. So it's very, very important that we take this very, very seriously and do whatever we can uh, to help. So let's see, can we help? Now, here the nurse has studied yet again. 16,000 women nearly, 438 in infertility. And they uh, looked at their diets, and they found if you only change 5% of your protein intake, only 5%, you don't even have to become vegan. And my patients hate the word vegan. I never mention it at all. Never mention it. <laughs> don't mention vegan. <Viva. laughs> but if you only change 5%, you have a 50% lower risk of infertility. That's huge. Only 5%. 
No, mainly no, obviously would improve as well. Uh, here's the Danish study there. Obviously we always have to look at the, we're always dealing with two patients, either the mother of the baby or the mother of the father, to be, or whatever. Anyway, so the men have to be looked at as well, and their motility is firm, but the motility increases as well. And um, coming to my next patient, let's call it Jessica, 37 years old, primary infertility, so never had conceived, for three years waiting, finally said, well, I might give Dr. Bartos to go, you know, after I tried everyone else, he's the last on the list. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, him anyway, he's good math with all this guy's stuff. <laughs> so off she comes, 33 BMI, small ovaries, very small ovaries. I was very concerned when I did this test, very small. AMH, the anti malarian hormone, which is a fertility test, fertility marker, shows how well the ovaries are going, how many follicles there are, all that. Very low, 0.4, so really poor prognosis. Day 21 progesterone was, 30, was 22. <coughs> Should be over 30 to show an ovulation. Didn't look. <coughs> okay. Um, let's see if we can do something for you. Put on a whole food plant based diet. And these are her day 21 cholesterol, right? That's where we started. Start the diet, right? Off she goes, higher, 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 every month, bang, unconceived. Fantastic result. Unfortunately, that's where her motivation ended. <laughs> she wasn't prepared to keep it going while she was pregnant, unfortunately. And that's what happened then, of course, because um, as she obviously has a high BMI, she's a bit of metabolic syndrome, so her baby got that metabolic syndrome too, got back, uh, got big as well, and she had a failed reduction on that. And I kept trying to preach to her, even my midwife went vegan just to convince her that, but not to be, but I sort of. Okay, moving on to another concern. Obviously, we're not going to cover every room says to the work, just <laughs> if you want. But we have to talk about fibroids, because obviously women are very concerned about fibroids. So a little case control study on risk factors for uterine myoma is conducted in Italy, 1986 to 1997. Cases included 843 women with uterine myomas whose clinical diagnosis dates back no more than three years. And controls were 115,000, uh, uh, sorry, 1,500 women who had other reasons. Here again, we see it, red meat. Yeah, so 1.7% higher, uh, 1.7% higher chance of fibroids. Ham, say, green veg, lower, and fruit. <coughs> and why is that? Because we have insulin-like growth factor stimulated by the gut bacteria, right? And you have the hormones. That's why. Another study there from China, case control study, 600 Chinese hand women. And, fibroids. and again, when they looked at what they ate, broccoli brings the risk right down, cabbage brings the risk right down, tomatoes, and apples. Isn't that fantastic? Old saying is still true, two apples a day keeps the doctor at bay. And let's look at another patient. And let's call her uh, Chloe. She came to me initially with uh, irregular heavy periods, that was before I saw all these things. Primary infertility, BMI 28. Um, constipated, polycystic ovaries, little hysteroscopy for her, um, didn't look good, tubes were both blocked, unfortunately. The uterus had some synecdoche as well. So there wasn't much which could be done from that point of view, unfortunately, um, because the tubes were blocked and the uterus, uh, as I said, had some adhesions inside, so the cavity wasn't really ready to conceive. Anyway, she came back two years later, um, after she's been through the infertility journey and all that. Multiple fibroids she'd grown by that stage, you know, two centimeters more. She had a lot of premenstrual tension, periods were irregular and heavy. So I tried Olipristol, which is an anti progesterone, but she couldn't tolerate it. Her liver enzymes went sky high and they just stopped it. So I said, okay, try to try a whole food plant based diet and see how it goes. And yes, she did the um, heavy fat course. And eight months later, symptom free, fibroids had gone. There were only tiny little specks left which were inactive, no blood supply to them. And she was so happy about it all, I presented her actually um, as a live patient at a mini med school we always run for our transition med uh, in the school. And she was happy to talk about her experience and she had a completely changed person. Um, her mood was completely changed and really happy and yeah, nobody even comes anymore. And it's so gratifying. 
to uh, live out holes in as you like it. It may be an mitosis, it may be just this menorrhea, and this may be just a catch-all term which catches everything. And then when they are more mature, there may be a perception that they have a product. Um, there may be a lot of health anxiety, and we have that a lot in the rest of Ireland, and we have a lot of constipation. Now, um, they did a um, crossover study there with 33 women on a low fat vegetarian diet versus regular diet, Neil Bernard's uh, team, and they found the dysmenorrhea reduced from 3.9 to 2.7 days uh, on a low fat vegetarian diet. Pain severity was significantly lower, and SHVD, as we said already, is higher on a whole food plant based diet. Another case study there. Um, this uh, lady was known for, uh, to me for many years, and she looked after her during, uh, through her pregnancies, and that was all before my plant based journey, my own one. She had ulcerative colitis. She was exercising regularly in cancer, and uh, she had normal BMI. Couldn't tolerate the pain because a lot of mood swings on that, and now she was back to me at 42 years of age uh, with very heavy periods, chronic type pain, and when I did her lipid, uh, profile, actually her lipids were quite high, so was her cholesterol, and, uh, but she still had a normal BMI. So I um, suggested her as well to go on a whole food plant based journey, and she did this for eight weeks increased energy, less bloating, the ulcerative colitis improved. Her whole family went with her on the journey, also all improved, and then she infected, so to speak, her co-workers as well, uh, who also benefited from this journey. So they have a bit of a um, cascade effect there as well, which is quite nice. Which, uh, let's move on then to the more mature patients. They often have actually these pressure symptoms and chronic pelvic pain, and a very common disease behind these is actually diabetical disease. These are data from the EPIC study, uh, which is a big international study here in Europe and different centers. Here you again see the diverticular disease. Uh, if we set the meat eaters at one, then we see the fish eaters a little bit less risk, the vegetarian has even lesser risk, and the vegan have hardly any risk at all of having diverticulitis. Hardly any risk at all. This is a, a patient who actually used to work with me, a psychosis nurse, and um, she came to me with pressure symptoms. We believed it was, it was a prolapse. Well, you here believed it. Put in a ring. What's pressure? Well, I mean, the pressure was still not gone. And then we saw, got chatting a bit, as one thought, does like to chat with one's patients occasionally, and you meet them regularly. And it emerged that she always had this constipation her whole life, from her kids' years. That's why I pick up the story from the kids' years again. She had this constipation and never anything worked for her. She was taking prunes and all this sort of stuff and nothing. So then, okay, why don't you do the happy pair, happy gut course? Right. The whole food plant is gone. And she did it. And I was quite surprised that she actually did. Right. But uh, obviously, she trusted me somewhat from heavy work with the side of And uh, she did the course, and her symptoms were gone. For the first time in her life, at 73 years of age, she was pain free. And it's just a matter of first time in her life. And how satisfying that is that this patient comes back then and it moved me to tears, honest God. It moved me to tears to see her so much better having suffered all her life with it. You know? And I was, I mean, obviously it wasn't me or whatever, but uh, that's to bring this stone rolling to see that it makes actually such a difference in the place of life. Amazing stuff. Yeah, I don't want to really travel on too much longer, uh, but just in general, I wanted to sort of put, um, on population studies. And we have so big population studies now, as I said at the start, nurses have studied yet again 121,000 people, uh, female religious nurses, then the health professionals follow up study, there's another 51,000. And um, these cohorts have been described elsewhere already. And just to show here the overall mortality, overall mortality, right, uh, just to point, uh, come up a bit for the morning, I suppose. And you can see here, if you set dairy at zero, right? Okay, then you see with processed meat, the overall mortality goes up that much. And it literally is off the scale. Literally. It doesn't fit on the ground. And here you have eggs. My one colleague of mine who just won't give up eggs, and I get her all the studies, and I keep sending studies, but she won't give up. <laughs> processed meat, fish, poultry, and based on. 
And uh, just to answer the protein question once and for all, you always say, oh, I don't get enough protein. Mm. Uh, look at this here. This is human milk, and this is cow's milk. See how much protein is in there, how much protein is in there. No more questions about protein, I hope. <laughs> if the kid is growing past, it only needs that little protein that must do. Now, finally, the Green Impact Initiative for GP practice is running in the UK. And, Jim, I don't know if you want to talk about that later yourself. Um, but it's our Bay project, and I think we hope we need something like that in the Ireland as well. So, really make an impact. Thank you so much, guys.